Hi, welcome to Fast Forward Live. And joining me is award-winning authors, Ellen Kushner and Delia Sherman. Welcome to Fast Forward. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much for making this happen, Mike. I'm excited, I want you to know. <laughs> um, you guys look like you're in your kitchen. We so are in our are kitchen. You... We, we yeah. suddenly, like 20 minutes ago, thought, oh my God, what are we gonna do for lighting? You know, it's not daytime and where can we both sit comfortably that won't make us look like corpses? And our kitchen is a celebrated place on the internet. So yeah. why not invite you into our kitchen? Oh, that's very nice. It's lovely to be there. So you're back in New York, right? Yeah. Because you guys travel a lot. And one thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of the writing process is what it's like when you're, do you, are you, more comfortable writing at home in New York or when you're off in one of your little travels oh. to all over the to all over the world writing? I'll I'll answer first so as not to embarrass myself. It, I can only write when I'm like in perfect solitude with absolute silence and a lot of food. So I actually, a lot of my traveling and why I never answer anyone's letters is because I've gone off on a retreat, but, and I've gotten a lot of that done this year, which is these last two years, which has been fantastic because we couldn't go anywhere else. Then we have these crazy, wonderful travels, which get me so excited that I never sit down and write anything, but they're perfect for you. I like I, I like distractions. I think it must be a wiring issue, but I just, I, I like having to work to concentrate. I concentrate better when I have something to, to shut out rather than when I've got nothing. Um, so I like to write on airplanes. I like to write in cafes. Um, I can actually pretty much write anywhere. Um, so I, I, I write when we travel. And when I have a nice, quiet place to do it and I don't have to do anything else, that's lovely, but that doesn't happen often, so I don't. Yeah, you've said you're a social writer. And, I like yeah. writing dates, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, does where you are when you're writing affect how you're writing or what you write? Is it better if you're writing certain things if you're in certain places? No, I don't think so. I think it's just easier for me to concentrate when there's something going on outside of me. Although it depends, because when we were writing the one thing we did together, which was the novel, The Fall of the Kings. Oh, yeah. Delia had to create an entire university's worth of characters. And she went, <laughs> we were living in Somerville, Massachusetts at the time. And she kept going just as because she likes to write in cafes. And she found this one cafe in Davis Square. Um, and ended up just needing faces, needing characters. And so everybody who- Every barista in that cafe is in that cafe. <laughs> their faces. I have no idea. I don't even know their names. I never did know their names, but their faces are in there. And, and a sense of, of, oh, you can pop up the Fall of the Kings cover because it looks so fabulous. Yes, there it is with both our names on it. Oh, and- um, Tom Canty. Yeah. yeah. That's a gorgeous yeah. cover. But anyway, so I think in that sense, you were sort of right place, right time, yeah. right ambiance. Yeah. yeah. And, but in, and, and one of the things that I do when I'm in a public space is that if I need a face for a character, I go, you. And in fact, <laughs> back when we were, we were going to Paris a lot in a place that my family sublet near the Luxembourg Gardens, I, when I was writing um, The Privilege of the Sword, um, I, there's a lot of Paris in that book anyway, in all, and in fact, the, that background that you're seeing there is a picture of, um, old Paris that I saw in a shop window and sent as a, a sample to my publisher. And they ended up putting it on the cover, which was as much of a surprise to me as it was to anyone. <laughs> I love it. That's Paris. But I, and, and just walking, we were in, it's a slightly fashionable district. And I would walk past these places with these amazing, you know, brocade party dresses, and an, right next to an antiquarian bookshop. And I think it would it be the same book if I hadn't been there, maybe, but there's something very pleasant about having where you are kind of coincide with, with what you're writing about. On the other hand, I've also written on a cruise ship, staring out at the waves in a bar during the daytime when nobody was there. And 
I don't think that had a lot of effect on what I was writing. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember any cruise novels. <laughs> well, it's, it's in the work in progress, to be honest. Uh, ah, ah. Now, this always so works. Well, 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 we are going back to Paris soon, and, and my current novel is set there. So, um, ah. the well, you're, we're going on, to do research. We're going to do research. We're yeah, not going to have yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you guys the kind of writers that go down in the rabbit holes of research? No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Knowing you guys, that doesn't surprise me at all. Well, this kind of segues into what I was just saying, which was that I lived in Par in Europe when I was a kid. Uh, my family spent a year living outside Paris where my dad had work. And I realized many years later that that, that sense of ancientness that is real in Europe really kind of got into my skin and is one reason that I loved reading fantasy and something that I pull up when I'm writing fantasy. Um, and I've always traveled a lot and, you know, read strange books. So that's my research. Uh, I just make a bunch of stuff up, but it always turns out to have its roots in real places and places I've been. Um, but you actually, you actually reference real history. Well, I, well, I use real history. I, I, I don't think of it as a rabbit hole. I think of it as a fishing expedition. <laughs> and I, I, I have a tendency to catch more fish than catch and release quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the ones I keep are very precious to me. <laughs> I keep the special ones. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cause I, and I know that for instance, for, um, freedom bays, which I adore. Um, and I think I mentioned to you, it's one of the books that actually had me tearing up um, when when she reads the letter at the end. Oh, that got me all you. teary. I think I told you that. I was so that. hoping so, that would happen. <laughs> um, but that, you can't, you know, it's in Louisiana and you were there. I mean, you spent time there as a child. You had vacations, I think. And my mother's did a lot family of was from there, yeah. Ah. But then we did yet, this crazy research trip together when she was revising the book yeah. and drove around, you know, in a rental car in our black leather jackets all over backwoods, Louisiana, <laughs> looking for slave quarters, actually, for old slave quarters. But, but I did put a lot of my visits to my relatives and, and the I mean, I, I, I did not know verbally about the laws about things like you, black people weren't weren't welcome everywhere but i could see the signs i could read and and i never i always thought it was unfair i really even when i was little and my mother was kind of on board with it i was like no <laughs> that doesn't seem reasonable to me so i tried to put that that's that's sort of where i started was was with my experience of um, the, the the racism that was in the air and my own discomfort with it, even though I had to go along because I was, you know, 10. Um, and and it was not part of the zeitgeist at that point to, to say yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. Now, that book is obviously Louisiana, but I've always been curious. I don't think we've ever talked about this. For the Riverside books, is that based on any place in particular? Or is it a bunch of places? I mean, yeah, it's set in Bookland. It's set in Bookland yes. with with a strong slice of where I was living at the time, which was um, New York in the eighties. Um, some people really recognize things from there. There's nothing specific, but there's a certain tenor to Riverside and the neighborhood I was living in, which is now very upscale, was not upscale at the time, um, and it was kind of dangerous. You know, you had to be really careful walking home from the subway. So that worked its way in. And I think is one of the reasons that I wrote Swords Point was that sense of what it was like to, you know, be young and living somewhere exciting, edgy, dangerous, and incredibly attractive. Um, and then I mixed in all the cities that I really loved, uh, that I'd read about, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, Georgette Heyer's descriptions of London and Paris, uh, trying to, you know, that kind of thing. And, and then with a certain, again, a certain slice for the low lives of Damon Runyon, his 1940s <laughs> New York guys who are in Guys and Dolls is the musical. Yeah, that, oh, I love Damon Runyon. That's, that's in there too. I really feel very strongly that the, the crooks 
in Riverside do not sound like Charles Dickens characters. They sound like Damon Runyon characters. <laughs> And I actually That's did a wonderful. short story in which I tried to take on a Damon Runyon voice in first person. It's called the uh, the Duke of Riverside, and it's actually up online. And uh, you know, so it's a it's, it really is a mix of everything I kind of like. I moozled it all together and you know, put it all into a. It's a very personal thing for me. You know, it's not yeah. just one place. It's every place that I really like. It, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Riverside books. Uh, mm -hmm. some great characters and things. Um, you guys collaborated on one of the Riverside books on uh, the, the Fall of the Kings. Now, what was that like? How did you do the collaboration? Well, Ellen was working in like 80 hour weeks in radio at that point doing sound. Oh, that's right. Spirit. And she really, really wanted to be working on a book. And and I, we used to have conversations whenever we'd take a road trip or whatever about you know, some of the characters and their further adventures and other things that they could do and other times in Riverside, just because, you know, if you're on a long trip, you talk about stuff. And so one day I looked at her and I said, this is a story and we could get paid for doing this. You know, <laughs> So I got out my notebook because I we traded uh, drivers because I don't get sick when I write in a car. And um, she drove and we talked about it and we 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 found the characters and so it was scratched out a plot and, yeah. and scratched out a plot. And then things got complicated. <laughs> well, it was a short story first. We did it as a short story and we had oh. to cut so much. Uh, to make it a short story, it was for um, Nicola Griffith and Steve Pagel's um, that Bending the Landscape, that first ever queer anthology yeah. of fantasy and then one of science fiction as well. And we had to cut so much that I said, let's just put it all back in and turn it into a book. And we did. Um, and then it got complicated. It was complicated. It was very complicated. <laughs> Delia brought all her Dickensian I, 19th I century novel I chops can't help to it. Myself. <laughs> <You really> can't. <laughs> Like, I, I throw off characters like a cat. It's a disease, you know, Delia. It sparks. It's terrible. It ain't a lean, mean machine. I'll tell <laughs> no, you that. It is. <laughs> I so, believe in oh. abundanza. But, but, you know, if you want to know what the, the real nitty gritty was that she was working in my world. So I had certain veto rights. Uh, but my the, search was really easy. Yeah. Just shouting <laughs> downstairs, honey, you know, where are they? <laughs> oh, Okay. So there was that, but also we each kind of ended up owning certain characters. Like she owned the university and I owned the, um, most of it takes place on the hill. There's not a lot of Riverside in that book, as I, as I recall. No, gotcha. And so. Uh, so when I say owning, it meant that sort of each of us had sort of veto power over that set of characters. You know, I could write a scene with her characters in it. And if she said, no, he, he wouldn't do that. Or here, give me that. I'm going to rewrite it so it sounds like him. I mean, not only couldn't I complain, but I didn't complain. It was great. And and yeah. she and she did the same thing. I mean, yeah. she she rewrote her characters when I wrote them in a scene. I would like to say that this was extremely good practice for me when a few years ago um, somebody came to me and asked if we could do a collaborative prequel to Swords Point yeah. online. Uh, was Julian Yap for Serial Box, which yes. is now oh. in the realm. But before it was named Realm, it was Serial Box. And I got together with a bunch of writers and wrote four seasons worth of episodes of this Swords Point prequel. But it was very much the same thing that I re people brought all kinds of stuff that they had invented to my world. And I loved it. But every now and then I would just say, no, 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 no. And yeah, it worked great. And you had like meetings at your house with all the writers, like a writer's room. They it was, we, like it was doing it a was the second series. one he'd done. Yeah, it was the second one Julian had done, and he was trying to model it on television so that instead yeah. of you know sitting and watching a one hour TV show or a 59 minute TV show, you would read a story that took about the same amount of time. And yeah. we it was called HBO for readers, and fortunately, we also did audio for it almost as an afterthought. These wonderful people that I um, new from my work in audiobooks, um, did the characters. And now it's interesting, uh, Realm is really pushing it as audio rather than as um, as ebooks. Hmm. And they're wonderful. I really recommend them. It's, oh, we never oh, said yeah. it was called, did we? It's called Tremontaine. It's called Tremontaine. Yeah. And it's, and it's really about uh, the Duchess in her earlier life. Did you know her background and her 
No. Backstory no. when you did Swords Point, though? Absolutely not. We made it up on the spot. Melinda <laughs> Lowe was a huge, you know, adherent of the Duchess. And uh, basically the first season group kind of made up all the details and we went from there. And, and I did mean, so well. It, it's creepy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I also did a, a collaboration with a playwright called Liz Duffy Adams of um, yeah. on one of those things about Charles II and told from the point of his wife, the, the Catherine of Braganza. Uh, and it was called uh, Whitehall. Whitehall, and, yes. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, we we kind of show ran that, and we also um, co-wrote three episodes because she's primarily a playwright, and there's a huge difference between narrative prose and um, and theatrical, you know, yeah. dialogue. So um, and she wrote most of the dialogue though. She was just great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were both real. I love Tremontaine. When that when I saw that was there, I just kept. It was like what every week there would be another chapter or something, and mm -hmm. I just and I love that whole backstory of hers. And the thing in the Riverside books, and I've mentioned this before to you, that I adore is the mathematics. <laughs> How <laughs> important <laughs> math is, you know. There, in, there's in a the scene in, series, yeah. in one of the books with. You know, there's, a, I think, I don't know if it's Richard or Alec and somebody else, and there's a man and a woman, and they're sitting in this this oh, room, and they're yeah. talking mathematics, and it is almost sensual. Oh, I know. That's in, that's in um, book two. That's in Privilege, and it's Alec and yeah. his, his friend, the, uh, the, the uh, big, fat, sloppy mathematician woman who I just adore. I, you yes. know, and I don't know anything about math. I'm terrible at math. And I think to me, it's just so exotic um, <laughs> that I put it in all the time. It's the most exotic thing I can think of. And we have friends who yeah, are mathematicians who help. I, I was a math major way, way back when there were much fewer numbers back then. Well, and there, there's lots of math geekery in, um, in, I mean, like part of the plot hinges on math, a math geek uh, in Trementen. So oh, I'm God, yes. Happy. With Micah. <laughs> I Micah. love Micah. Oh, everybody loves Micah. <laughs> and I love the way the math could have changed the world. Yeah. In Tremontaine. I just it just made me goose pimply. <laughs> it was so much fun. Um, let me ask you something else. Let's shift a little bit. Um, as a two writer household, how does that work? Do you each have your own separate spaces? Oh yeah, we um, even when we moved to New York City, knowing that we weren't going to be able to get you know a huge house by any means, uh, we looked for an apartment that had two rooms with doors that would close for each you know one for each of us. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have a routine to your writing? Do you have a certain number of pages? Do you have certain times That's for you write? No, that's like, <laughs> that's the modern generation does all that crap. We just write stuff. Um, Ellen, I have more of a routine than Ellen does. Yeah. I, I, I try very hard to write 40 minutes a day because I lose, especially since I'm writing a very long and complicated novel, I have to keep at it or I will completely lose it. And then I will spend three days trying to remember what the hell I'm writing about before I can start writing again. So even though I can't make a lot of headway, you, you still make headway on 40 minutes. You know, you can do you could do a certain number of pages in 40 minutes. If things are going well, um, I can do I write longhand. Um, so I, I can do three um, manuscript pages in a notebook. Um, and if things are going really well, I can do six. Uh, but usually it's more like two and a half. <laughs> uh, but really, it's um, for, for me, it really works. And whenever I get to the point, it's sometime in the hour, I'm the only afternoon writer I know. Uh, that is my preferred time to write. That's like so, blasphemy. <laughs> it's not blasphemy. It's it's wiring. <laughs> oh, that's it's right. I forget. You're you're weirdly window. wired. Yes. So I I um I you I around two o'clock I start thinking I really need to do it now. And if I can go longer, I do go longer. But I will always I will usually set the timer for forty minutes because as soon as I hit that button, it seems to be the signal for my hand has to start moving. 
And even if I don't know what I'm doing and my first sentences are, I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but this scene has to go somewhere. And I really want to end up there. Usually by the time I write a paragraph of that burbling, if I need to, um, then I, I, will, I will finish the scene. Or at least I will have some very useful notes, one or the other. And Ellen, you just write whenever the hell it hits you? You know, it's every decade I have to kind of change my technique. Like I can't stay up all night the way I used to. I like afternoon, as it turns out. But I also like early evening, which ruins our social life. Um, and I'm just disorganized and undisciplined. And for years, I'll write under deadline, you know, I'll write under pressure. I'm one of those stressed out people who kind of needs pressure to get over myself. And finally, a bunch of my friends sat me down a few years ago and said, just give up. You're never going to be normal. So stop being embarrassed about it and just accept your weirdness. And that's why, I mean, I'm a sprinter. And for years, way back when I would, when I really needed to get something done, I would go off to the house or apartment of friends I had a variety of people who were going to be away. I was like, I will house it for you and I will write and there will be nothing to do except write. And my friend said, you should just um, institutionalize that and say that you can do whatever you want the rest of the month, but one week a month you're committing and you're going to say what week it is to being away and just writing. And um, I've been doing that for a couple of years now and it's, it's great. It's really great. It seems um, to work. Yeah. I mean, we, as you know, we have a kind of complicated life and we're in New York city and we're very social and it was oh, good. Yeah. We've got a big apartment um, that takes a lot of upkeep. And uh, so it, it, when, you know, running the trains has been, I have to say when the pandemic, so in other words, there's a lot to do other than write. Um, <laughs> and I hang out too much on Facebook and uh, Twitter, but also just there's, there's, it's like complicated life. I finally realized, because I used to be so embarrassed about it. And Delia finally said like, other people's lives. I'm like, why aren't we like other people? She said, because their lives are regular and ours aren't. They can yeah. figure out what their patterns are, and we can't, and that's that's terrible for me. So I just have to separate. And we're both things. a little allergic to a certain kind of pattern. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is just as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. I'm like the I'm like the 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 crazy uncle. Like you don't want to be like me, young writers. Avoid being <laughs> like me at all costs. I have nothing good to tell you about how to do it. Don't be like do me. as I say, not as I do. Yeah, exactly. I have I have great advice, <laughs> but you know that thing where there's a writer that you like and you think, well, how does she do it? And uh, no, I'm not even going to tell you because it's very bad for you. <laughs> you know, I, I know enough writers to know there's no one way. They're all different. Yeah, they all do it differently, and and whatever works for them is the right way. Whenever Delia and I teach, and you know the kids want the golden handshake, the kids. I mean, basically, a kid is anyone I'm teaching. I don't care how old you are. Um, we say, think of what has worked best for you in the past and just figure out a way to do it. Don't try to do what somebody else does. Don't read, you know, a book that says you must always get up in the morning and write before you talk. And I mean, it's just it's bullshit. You, you, in the back of your mind, you know what's going to be best for you. And the trick is to find it out and respect it. And it changes. It changes because I used yeah. to be able to write before I could talk. I used to get up first thing in the morning and write. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we get older. <laughs> it happens. Now, yeah. do you guys like, enjoy rewriting or is it a chore? I adore rewriting. I am a terrible writer. My 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 zero drafts, you know, the the steam comes off of the muck. Um, and <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm a very good rewriter. And once I've gotten seven or eight drafts under my belt, it's pretty good. Yeah, Alan, what about find, you? I used to find rewriting very challenging um, because if it didn't come out perfectly the first time, which it sometimes did. Uh, and still does, I just didn't know what to do. And I learned a huge amount about revision really while I was working on my national radio series because I had to write scripts and then I had to revise them and revise them. And it's like I learned that I had power um, and that it wasn't all just, you know, intuition and genius that, that you really, you could take control and go, it's going to be work, but I can do it. Like when you're when you're little, and by little, I mean you haven't published anything yet. I don't care how old you are. I would get to various points in stories and attempted novels and go, this is too hard. I can't do it. 
And the truth was I couldn't. But you really have to force yourself through that. And once you've done that and realized that it's just hard work, it's really unpleasant, but it's really hard work, um, then you can never say, I can't do it again. And there were this, this current novel that I'm trying to write has just really been kicking my butt. And every now and then I'll just sit down and say, just do the work. I'm just going to have to do the work. Um, that said, I do like rewriting now. I, I, I like rewriting on a sentence level. I adore rewriting on a sentence level and always have because it's just, you know, making your words exactly right. But on a, a, a but the macro revision and, the you know, moving things around and putting this sentence here and, and this section here instead of here and then trying to make it, you know, flow very naturally. It's work. Um, sometimes I like it. Sometimes I don't. Depends on how hard it is. Um, but there are those, the, the thing that's encouraging about revision is, you know, you realize you don't have to get it right the first time. You can get it wrong the first time. And I've slowly come to realize that the wronger I let myself write it, the more triumphant I'm going to be when I fix it. I mean, I've been hearing this for years and even telling people this, but not always experiencing it myself, that, that feeling that if you just write a bunch of crap. And then the next day or the next week or the next month, you'll look at it and go, oh, I know what to do with this. And that's a really nice feeling. And I think I, I just haven't let myself write crap enough, uh, on purpose anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and on so, the other hand, I, I got into a bit in, in the novel and I was exhausted. Like I literally could not even see the paper uh, or the screen, I don't remember. And I thought, just just write anything. It was, how does this girl feel about something? She's falling asleep and thinking about something. And I just went, uh, she thinks this and this and this, and I'll fix it in the morning. I woke up in the morning, read it, and went, it's perfect. Like, I was so tired that I just <laughs> her and wrote what she thought. There you go. So um, you mentioned that you're working on something right now. Let me ask you guys, what are you working on? What's coming out, so, you know, anytime soon? Any What's going on? There's nothing coming out soon because it, this is a very long and complicated novel and it's taking me a long time to write it and I'm not done with it yet. Um, it, I, I am writing it on spec. Uh, it's it's my first adult novel since Porcelain Dove. Well, since since Fall of the Kings, but mm -hmm. but but that was a collaborative novel, so it's different. It's not it's not speculative. Um, it it has a it has a possibly fantastic element in it, but not very but it's not very forward. It is absolutely straight history. I have not changed any of the dates to make it more convenient. I have not changed anything, um, which means that there's a lot of research involved. Um, and it's about the people that history happened to during the, God help me, Franco-Prussian War, Siege of Paris and Commune. So wow. I, am, I am currently I am currently preparing to slaughter the entire working population of Paris <laughs> and crying every day. <laughs> no wonder you've been in such a bad mood. <laughs> oh my God! And that's the one called I think it's the Absinthe Drinker. Yes, it's called the Absinthe. Because you mentioned something about it somewhere online. Um, yes, I have because I complain a lot. <laughs> well, and every now and then she goes on Facebook and goes. So who knows about photography in the 19th century? Because I need to know the name of something. And bam, all like 18 people turn out to know. It's yeah, of, isn't I, the I internet did, amazing for the research now? I, I did write a short story called La yeah. Fée Verte um, many years ago now, um, which was published by, uh, I think it was- It was, was Datlow and Windling. It was, it was, da it was in Datlow and Windling. Um, and that was, that, that was the genesis of, of the book. Ah, uh, uh, and then you've also had the Great Detective came out on tour.com. That's recently. and that's going to be part of my next novel. Ah, uh, which I got a big kick out of. It's it's Sherlock Holmes. The beginning of Sherlock Holmes is an automaton. Yes, <laughs> it's a trip. I'm I, I I'm really looking forward to getting back to that because I can. Yeah. Um, it, there's still going to be a lot of research, but at least it'll be in English. <laughs> <laughs> and Ellen, what are you working on? What's... I am actually doing another Swords Point Riverside book. Ah. And it's about Alex Bastard, daughter of the angriest teenager in the world. It <laughs> takes, I seem to write of books course. that take place both in my life and in Riverside world 15 years after other books. And in this case, it, it takes place about 15 years after the end of The Privilege of the Sword. 
So you, if you know my books, don't read them in, in, in short stories. There's a lot of those too. Yeah. In fact, on my website, you, I have pages devoted to explaining all of this. Um, and so uh, you can go to my website and find it all out. But and there it I is. don't write them in order. I don't write any of this stuff yeah. in order. They're short stories that take place before and after, and there's term on 10, and then there's novels. And so don't, don't go, go by pub date. It's not linear at all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, something I got to talk to you about a little bit is the Golden Gradle. Oh, yeah. Which is, was like a, it was like a spoken word concert thing with a klezmer band originally. This is the project that will not die. It has been everything except an animated TV special. If anyone out there is Ooh. listening who does animated TV, wouldn't it be a great animated yeah. TV special? So I started it when I was on doing radio, public radio in Boston, and I got together, we got a grant to do a live show. And so I wrote this with the klezmer band Shireem, who had already taken the Nutcracker Suite and done it as a klezmer suite. And I said, well, let me write a story for you that goes with it. And then we'll do a, a narration with music, kind of like Peter and the Wolf, only it's the golden dreidel. So we took a, a Christmas classic and turned it into a, a Hanukkah story, a fantasy, of course. And then we recorded it as a radio special and sold that to Ryko Disc as a CD. And then somebody in publishing in Boston said, oh, could you write this up as a book? We'll do an illustrated book. And so I did. And then I came to New York and started meeting theater people. And one of them said, well, this would make a great children's play. So I wrote it as a children's play and I actually got to be in it the first year. So that was done twice here in New York. And then all of us, I thought, all right, well, that project's good and dead. You know, book, book didn't sell so well that it was, you know, a big deal. And suddenly I get this uh, letter from my publisher a couple of years ago going, oh, we're going to reissue it with a new cover and new interior illustrations. And oh, that lovely. was the, aren't they great? Kevin, Kevin Keel? Yeah. I, I, artist? Wow, yeah. beautiful. But I, so all of a sudden this year, it's a new book. Um, you can show it to everybody again if you want. Yeah, show, and, so let, uh, yeah, show the golden dream. There and we then, go. Yeah, and it looks very modern, very fresh, very different from the previous version. And also, frankly, I'm like, I'm snappier at promotion on the internet now, and there's more <laughs> internet to promote on. And I think it's it's done rather well this year. I'm really pleased. Cool. Yeah, it'd be a great animated. Right? Yeah. I, I told mean, my agent, and she said, well, they don't do that that much. And I'm thinking, well, they can do it for me. Yeah, I don't know. We'll Netflix. Do they do animated? Netf animated I yeah. Don't know. yeah. HBO Max, all these places do animated stuff. I, my, Beth and I watch them all the time. Well, I'll tell them you said so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell them. I fast forward says. <laughs> uh, well, this has been great, guys. I have had so much fun, but we probably need to wrap it up. Um, I have had, this has been so easy and so much fun and you guys are delightful and thank you. I, I would just thank like you. to say something, which yes. is that you probably usually do one person at a time. No, we recently we've been doing two. Well, we've but been, that means been... that like, we didn't get enough, like each of us should have a total half hour. Um, <laughs> like we each only got about 15 minutes. And so, it's yes. Right. No, I'm not, don't. No, it's not all right. <laughs> I, I'm just, you know. I'll, 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 talk to, I'll talk to the team. Okay. It's also very funny because you and I have been talking about doing a, getting us on your show for 10 God, years ages. now, 20 years. Yeah. And it's only thanks to the magic of the internet that we now have been able to do it, even though we're not in the same town as you. Yes. Yes. Oh, and I have to say, so that Kathy doesn't kill me later, people don't forget to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can click the like, you can click on the little bell and you'll find out when things happen. All those things help us. So remember to subscribe and like and click and do all that stuff. Okay, so I did, I my, like I did my thing. <laughs> thank you, Ellen, I like you guys. <laughs> um, so I wanna thank you so much for taking time to join us. It's been fun and uh, this is Mike Zipser from Fast Forward saying, wear a mask, get vaccinated, damn it. Take care. <laughs>